I promised you that I would tell you some true stories about estate tax planning and how it works. And I want you to understand if you're not a professional, if you're a professional, you may already know this. If you're not, this is possibly new to you. But there is a federal estate tax when you die, and it's based upon any assets exceeding $11,700,000 in value. That exemption is also your gift exemption. You could give away $11,700,000 if you want to, and I'm glad to send you my wire instructions for that. And then anything above that is subject to estate tax at the 40% rate. Now, if I die, I could leave whatever is remaining of my exemption amount. Let's say it's 11 million seven minus a million dollar gift I gave to my children. So now it's 11, 10 million seven. Now I die, everyone's very sad. Some of them may even go to the funeral and under my estate plan, 11 million seven can go into a trust that can be held for my spouse if she hasn't left me by then. And for her health, education, and maintenance, we call that a credit shelter trust because it shelters her credit. Isn't that brilliant? And then whatever that grows to is not subject to estate tax. And she can redirect where it goes when she dies among our descendants or subject to whatever limitations we have. So if you're watching this talk, do you have powers of appointment exercisable by your spouse to redirect how the assets would go for your descendants? And is it limited to descendants? Is it open to charity? Is it limited that you can't give charity more than 2% a year? The list goes on. Now, if I die with a $10,700,000 exemption and only 3 million goes to the Credit Shelter Trust, what happens to the other seven million seven? That goes to my spouse as what we call the portability allowance. If my estate will, will prepare the proper paperwork and sign it with the IRS, reporting the in information of my estate, and that my beloved wife now has an exemption, not of 11 million seven, but of 18 million seven. And she goes forward with that portability allowance, but it's not as good as the Credit Shelter Trust because it doesn't grow with inflation. It's stuck at the $7 million amount. And if she remarries and her new spouse dies before she does, she will have the new spouse's portability allowance and there may not be one in the future versus having mine. So those are important components to be aware of in any estate tax planning. So how do I set up a trust that would use my 10 million seven exemption if I only have $3 million worth of assets in my name and Marsha and I have 10 million of assets in joint names and we'd like to keep it joint? Well, we could set up a just trust called a joint exempt step up trust. And then on my death, so sad, so sad, full funding of the, of the Credit Shelter Trust from the Just Trust, and we believe a new income tax basis equal to fair market value of all of these assets in the Just Trust. So that's why a lot of people come to us with separate trusts for each spouse, or they come to us with a community property joint trust from California or Texas with a banjo on their knee, and we take off the banjo first because it's hard to concentrate when you're wearing a banjo. And then we consider transmuting out of community property status and using a jest instead. Why? Because community property is subject to creditor claims of either spouse. So if my spouse and I live in California and we've accumulated a $30 million estate, it's all in her name because I'm a neurosurgeon. I get sued she loses the 30 mil because of community property. So that's why you might want to transmute out of community property and go to a just trust. I'm not jesting. So we have some slides here, of course, more than I can cover in an hour. And slide 21 is what we show clients pretty often. So here's my trust. 
typical revocable trust on my death up to 11 million seven goes to the family bypass trust, which can be used for health education and maintenance of my spouse. Whatever it grows to will not be subject to estate tax or generation skipping tax at the level of my children if it's properly drafted. So we don't want an outright distribution to a child at any age whatsoever. I don't care if she's 123 years old, she's not getting an outright distribution from me. I want it to remain in a trust so it's never subject to a state tax at her death. And by the way, less likely to be lost to creditors, divorces, or dumb stuff. What about the life insurance trust? Well, if I have life insurance and I own it in my own name, when I die, it will be included in my estate for estate tax purposes. If it goes to my wife, it will qualify for the marital deduction. But then on her subsequent death, those assets are going to be subject to estate tax. So why not put the life insurance under an irrevocable life insurance trust? As long as it's bought fresh under the trust or in the trust at least three years before I die, that life insurance, no matter how much it is, will avoid federal estate tax. Now, the House Ways and Means Committee is at least teasing the insurance industry, saying that you won't be able to add assets or money to an irrevocable grant or trust, and 99% of life insurance trusts are grant or trusts. So what are we gonna do if it passes? Well, first of all, it probably won't pass because the life insurance industry is a sacred cow that Congress has been milking for years for campaign contributions, and that will continue to happen. But if you were not able to add assets to a life insurance trust, you would be able to do what's called split dollar loans. And you would loan money every year to the life insurance trust to pay the premiums, and it would be at the long-term applicable federal rate if you have a life expectancy of more than nine years, and you don't have to get any payments back until death, or until you terminate the policy. So that's just some basics here. There is a chart on page 25 of the Just Trust. Uh, I've named these spouses carefully, spouse one and spouse two, and the Just Trust can own various assets. It can provide that there's a spouse one share, a spouse two share, and a joint share. And if the clients break up, this can be consistent with their prenuptial agreement, but on the first death, everything can lock up and allow for uh, an exemption amount. So uh, that gives you a little bit of background. There's a lot of technical pages in here for the advisors on how a Jest Trust works. And if you Google uh, Gasman Jest Estate Planning, I think it comes up on our website and, and you see the uh, one of the citations for one of the articles on the Jest Trust. I wanna point out that there's more to life than estate tax planning, although that has been the only thing I've been living and breathing for the last 10 to 12 weeks. Confidentiality and creditor protection is also important. So page 45, the client comes to us owning property, doesn't want everyone on earth to know who owns the property, so we put the property in a land trust. It's a revocable trust. It almost doesn't exist for all purposes. Um, the client's the trustee of the trust. Now the property tax records show the client as trustee of a trust owning the property. You can't be sure who actually owns it. Or we form a Colorado, Wyoming, or Delaware LLC. Those are three of the states that do not disclose ownership or managers of an LLC. We make that LLC the trustee of the land trust. And then the only thing you see on the property tax records are the LLC's trustee. We do the same thing in Florida for homestead protection purposes, and we're able to get opinions from the property appraisers that this does not interrupt the homestead uh, exemption the homestead property exemption we have in Florida. Okay, now, just to remind you, you should have, if you've attended our past talks, 
our QPERT calculation chart. And we get a lot of questions on QPERTs. This is the Qualified Personal Residence Trust. Instead of owning my home, or instead of gifting my home to a trust for my children, which as a result, I would have to pay fair market value rent, I can put the home in a Qualified Personal Residence Trust. And then the future growth of the home would be out of my estate if I live a certain number of years. Or if I die during that term, the home stays in my estate, but the gift that I made is backed out. The nice thing about the Cupert, besides the fact that it needs almost zero maintenance once it's set up, is that there's a discount that you can take. For example, I, sorry about that. For example, if my home is worth 2 million five and I own half, Marsha owns the other half, I could gift my half of the home and consider that to be a million dollar gift because half of a home isn't worth half of the value of the home. And then if I don't, I mean, then if I retain the right to live there rent free for 10 years, it's only a $512,000 gift based upon somebody my age. Now, so all I have to do is put the home in the trust. My homestead exemption remains intact if it's properly drafted. And then in year 11, the home, which will hopefully be worth a million two by that time, even at 2% growth, will be out of my estate and I'll have to start paying rent to use it. So the rent will also be outside of my estate. And if this is a defective grant or trust, which is disregarded for income tax purposes and set up before, Dr. before President Biden signs a new law that would not allow this, then my payment of rent to the trust will not be a gift, will not be taxable, and my children will live happily ever after. If I die in year 20, then not only is the house worth a million five out of my estate, but the rent reinvested at 8% would give them another 523,000. So the estate tax savings here, 587,000 on just a deed that I make to a special kind of trust. And when you get the spreadsheet, you don't have to be in a spreadsheet excerpt, expert. They did what they call Allen proofing this spreadsheet. All you have to do is use the up down arrows because I hardly even know how to insert a value in a spreadsheet. I only design them. I don't actually drive them very often. So the 56-year-old Hubert, this is an actual situation. The home worth 2140000 Half the home's worth $1,070,000. Uh, without discounts, with a 15% discount, which the real estate appraiser should put in their report. You need to find a real estate appraiser who's willing to understand discounts for partial interests a $909,500 value. If put in a 10% Cupert, it's a gift of 581. If it's a 20 year Cupert, it's a gift of only 338,000 to get half of a $2,140,000 house out of your estate. And then uh, if you pay rent after your possessory term, and the rent is based on fair market value of the home multiplied by 0.8 by 8%, and then the rent grows by half percent a year, the estate tax savings will be considerable. So uh, this is an actual example of how we explained the Cupert to the married couple. And then we prepared two trusts for the spouse with the higher earnings and the shorter life expectancy also commonly known or most often known as the husband, his Cupert will say, I have the right to live in the house 10 years. After the 10th year, it's held for the health, education and maintenance of my beloved spouse. And so I can pay rent to it, re further reduce my estate. But if we need the money, the spouse can use this. this. It's a Cupert slat. My spouse does another slat Cupert, but it is not a slat because we're not comfortable that you can avoid the reciprocal trust doctrine by having different slats. So I do a, a 
a trust for my spouse and descendants, and my spouse does a trust, she gets the possessory term, and then after that it's for descendants only, but I can have the right to determine who the trustee is after she passes away, and possibly the right to be added as a beneficiary of the trust if it's formed in an asset protection jurisdiction. So do you have a Nevada Cupert? All your friends do. You should probably get one too. By the way, the discount here will not be possible after the new tax bill, if the Ways and Means Committee bill of September 13th applies. And Cuperts, I don't think will have much utility because they won't be disregarded for income tax purposes. Nobody's really pointed out how they would be used. So if you're gonna do your Cupert, you should get going. I also wanted to mention that there's another type of irrevocable trust that we commonly use when a child is going to have a home purchased or financed by the parent. And that is a 678 trust. 678 is uh, not the batting average of Babe Ruth. 678 is a code section, one of my favorite ones, which basically says if I set up a trust, and the trust may be for my spouse if she's not trustee and for my children and i give one of my children the right to withdraw what i put in that trust the year i put it in but if they don't exercise the withdrawal power it's gone they can't use it and then that trust is considered as owned by my child for income tax purposes even though distributions may not come out at all to my child the, the, the trust is disregarded and considered as owned by my child and the money I put into that trust could buy a very nice home for the child. And then when the child wants to graduate college and move away from that home, the sale of that home will be taxed to the child and also qualify for the $250,000 homestead sale exemption. So this is a great way to buy things for your children, but act now because these 678 trusts may not be available after enactment of the new proposed tax bill. Page 51, I'm just showing the different types of entities. You can review these with your lawyer or CPA or hairdresser uh, or whoever gives you advice, your psychic, to decide what entity is best for you. Right now, we are not filing S elections unless we're right up to the deadline. We are waiting for the new law because the new law may take away the savings that S corporations offer their owners in employment taxes and may make partnerships much more flexible and much more, or actually more inflexible. So uh, we're on hold there for a lot of entities and we're not putting as much Florida real estate into LLCs this year as we were, now that we see all this increase in the 10% cap situation. So stay tuned for that. For advisors, you have a lot of clients putting real estate into leveraged situations. Everyone has forgotten about 2008. Everyone's building like crazy with building costs at 140% of what they were a year ago, thinking that everything's gonna hold its value, that your property on the beach is really worth twice as much as it was last year. Let's buy three more properties on the beach and leverage them up with the bank. And oops, what happens to me when the bank takes that property back and writes off the debt because my lawyer did good creditor protection planning, well, I'm gonna pay an income tax on the reduction of debt unless that property is in an S corporation or a C corporation. So think about how you're gonna own property in this new environment and don't make any decisions, I think, until we get a new law uh, as far as deciding. Okay, so we have shown this slide many times, but when I talk to clients who have seen the videos, they just talk about the puppet. They don't really actually talk about this slide. But this is what I'm gonna call the freeze everything slide while you can. The clients come in and they go, well, what would you plan with for estate tax purposes? And the answer is everything, anything and everything 
that you can safely discount and sell to a trust or put in a grant or retained annuity trust, you should do while there's time because this structure under the new bill would be grandfathered. These lovely people, they're lovely because they hired me, have $20 million worth of assets. It's real estate investments, it's stocks, it's bonds, it's gold bullion, it's their collectible horse. All that stuff goes in the LLC. Preferably it goes in there 20 to 30 days before step two. So for a lot of new clients, we are instantly forming the LLC in Wyoming because Wyoming has great instant formation service or Colorado does also. Delaware is a lot more expensive, but works fine. We're getting a tax ID number that very day. By the way, the secret to getting a tax ID number that day is it has to have a name that's unique among the entire United States. So when you call the IRS and say, well, I have ABC Holdings in Florida, the IRS says, sorry, there's another person with ABC Holdings somewhere in the United States, we can't give you an ID number. So what you might wanna do is call the IRS first and get the same, get that ID number Say, well, my client wants to call this Yellow Dog LLC. Sorry, you can't. Okay, how about Yellow Dog 1245 LLC? Yep, okay, good. I've just formed Yellow Dog 1245 LLC by clicking my mouse with the Secretary of State of Wyoming. Would you please give me a tax ID number? And then the IRS person will cheerfully give you a tax ID number. And thank you, IRS people, for all you do. And I hope you don't get laid off for a few days by Congress, but if you do and you would like to learn how to draft a slat, I may have a job opportunity for you. Now, back to our thrilling story. It's thrilling for me at least. What do they do? They put the 20 million worth of assets in the brand new Wyoming LLC. You get those assets in there as soon as you can. And until you get the assets formally titled in there, you sign a nominee agreement, which says, that I hold these assets in my personal name, but consider them to be owned by the LLC under this nominee agreement and by the attached bill of sale. And when my brokerage firm finally gets the, is finally changes the paperwork, it will date back to the date of the formation of the Wyoming LLC and the signing of the nominee agreement. It has nothing to do with the Academy Awards, but if anyone would like to nominate me for an Academy Award, that would be fine. All right, so now we have the spousal limited access trust on the top left. You make a, uh, what was the other spouse makes a gift to it of $700,000 in cash or marketable securities, and then sells a 49.5% non-voting member interest in the LLC to the spousal trust in exchange for a $7 million note bearing interest at less than 2%. The other spouse does the same thing. It's more complicated than this. This is a simplified explanation. What happens in 10 years? The assets double in value to 40 million, we hope. But the spouses have only received 2% interest on these 7 million notes. That's 280,000 a year for 10 years. That's 2 million eight. But the trusts growing at 7% or 7.2% after the interest payment are now worth 13 million each because the LLC has 40 million in assets. It might liquidate, give 49.5% to each trust. The trust pays off the promissory note. You've got $26 million out of your estate based upon a $1,400,000 gift. So do you really need to use that $11 million exception, exemption, or are you gonna wait and just get this in place now? And then if they pass a bill that says that the uh, exemption's going down, now you can make large gifts, but you may not even have a lot to gift if you've reduced a $20 million estate to, to 13 million. So that all has to be taken into account. Now here's one I was working on this morning. 
The names have been changed to protect the innocent. And this is something that is really, I think, important to run numbers on. So Jay is a fictional person who has $11 million worth of stock ownership in a company that bought itself back from being public. So he has private stock, it's closely held, it's not easy to transfer, but it can be transferred. And he is going to form a SLAT, a Spousal Limited Access Trust. He's gonna have his wife and a Nevada co-trustee so that he could be added back to the trust if times were ever terrible. And then the SLAT is gonna own a Wyoming LLC so that his, so that when this stock is received by the trustees, they'll put it in the Wyoming LLC. His spouse will be the sole manager of the LLC so that the Nevada Trust Company doesn't have to do very much. They'll typically just hold a $5,000 account. And there he's used his $11,700,000 exemption or most of it. One risk here is that the IRS may come in and say that stock was worth a lot more than 11 million, so you owe gift tax. And then he's not taking a discount. So here's slide two. Slide two, and I'm sorry, slide one is blown up there. Now let's look at slide two. So slide two, you have slide one there to remember what it was. Jay is now going to form a Wyoming LLC and he will own 100% of it. 1% voting, 99% non-voting. And Jay is going to form a SLAT. And then instead of giving, I'm sorry, the Wyoming LLC is, is funded with the closely held stock worth 11 million. And now Jay determines that a 30% discount is reasonable and that his 99% non-voting member interest in the Wyoming LLC is worth seven million seven. So he does a formula gift to the SLAT which says I hereby give the lesser of 99% of this LLC or a portion of the LLC worth up to seven million seven. So what does that do? Well, the first thing is now he's made a 7 million seven gift instead of an 11 million gift. So he's got $4,300,000 in exemption remaining that he was going to use. And now he's not going to use it or something like that. It's not 3 million. Yeah, I think it's 4 million. Anyway, that's math for you. In addition to that, if the IRS questions slide one sale and it's he's gone over 11 million seven, he's going to owe gift tax. If the IRS questions slide two transfer, then if they say, aha, this is worth more than seven million seven, we're going to say, okay, what was it worth? Well, it was worth twice that much. Okay, well, then under the formula clause that we used, also called a wandry clause because the taxpayer wandry defeated the IRS by using such a document, then it turns out we only put half the non-voting stock into the LLC and there's no gift tax owed and he could use the other 4 million of exemption for whatever else he likes. So that is slide two. Now, Jay asked me by email yesterday, what is the downside of going with the Wyoming LLC this way? Well, the main downside is that besides the fact that we will do a wandry clause assignment, which is no big deal, we'll need a valuation report to attach to Jay's gift tax return that will need to be filed next year showing how the stock was valued and showing how the LLC discount came about. So figure on spending maybe up to $3,000 to find out what the 30% discount is and whatever you have to spend to uh, value the closely held stock, that could cost 12 to 13 million, I mean, 10 to, could cost eight to $12,000 typically. 
if it's a complicated company situation. But you're saving over, you're saving four million dollars of estate tax exemption. Uh, that's going to be a really nice savings. Yes, there's a cost. There's a joke among tax lawyers to always get an appraiser involved because they make our fees look small. But appraisers are very busy right now. So he's not, Jay's not crazy about filing a gift tax return and spending all that money on appraisals. He's got a friend who's a CPA who could put together an informal appraisal. It probably would stand up if the IRS looked at it, but it might not. So what's Jay's third alternative? That brings us to slide three. So on the top left-hand side, you have slide twos for your memory purposes. And on page 69, big, you got slide three. Jay makes a seed capital gift of the Spousal Limited Access Trust, I mean, to the Spousal Limited Access Trust, and then he sells the 99% non-voting member interest to the SLAT in exchange for a $7 million note. Now, he will have to report the $770,000 seed capital gift on a gift tax return, he is not required to report the sale. So he may forego 10 to $13,000 of valuation report costs and the time spent associated therewith at his own risk. No gift tax return has to, the gift tax return does not have to disclose the sale if it was an arm's length sale. But if he doesn't disclose the sale on a gift tax return, then the IRS has until after his death to question whether too big of a discount was taken on the sale. But now, if the tax law doesn't change, he's owed a $7 million note, and he could reverse this arrangement. He could say, well, it's 2022. Turns out the Republicans took back the House and the Senate. I didn't need that thing after all. How do I get out of it? Okay, well, we'll value the Wyoming LLC. Let's say it's worth 13 million. We might liquidate it and 13 million goes to the, uh, I'm sorry, value it at, at 13 million, but with discounts, the 99% member interest is worth 8 million or eight and a half million. So the slat, uh, he forgives the seven million note and he gives the slat another million five. And then the slat gives him his stock back. And the slat has two million two for the benefit of his spouse and descendants, and he has the rest back. So this is the installment sale is reversible here on page 69. Page 68, a transfer by sale uses more of the exemption and is not reversible. So what is the Biden two-step? It's not a dance, it's a move, a strategy. The first strategy being, let's sell, sorry, let's sell whatever we can at a discount to an irrevocable trust that's disregarded for income tax purposes, and let's forgive the note later on and call that the gift that you report on the gift tax return, not necessarily the details of the sale. So that way, Jay now has the freedom to know that future growth of this stock is gonna be out of his estate, and to know that if the estate tax goes away by some miracle, he can get most of his assets back out of the Spousal Limited Access Trust. Now, Jay is in a fantastic marriage, um, I think over 30 years, met his, met his wife in uh, graduate school. So everything they own is marital property, and when it goes in the slat, even though it's not his anymore, the slat says in the event of a divorce that half of the slat continues as what it is, except Jay has no voice in trusteeship, the other half of the slat continues as a Nevada trust for the children only, with the trustee being changeable by Jay, and Jay may be added back to the trust if his net worth goes down a by a certain amount. 
Now, if this was a second marriage situation where Jay has most of the assets, they are separate and apart from joint assets with, with his wife, and the premarital agreement protects those assets, then the slat's going to be worded differently. The slat's going to say, if we divorce, she's out, except to the extent that the trust has any marital assets. If the trust accidentally has marital assets, she'll get a slat of those assets, or at least half of those assets, the rest are going to benefit Jay's next spouse. And then the spouse after that, and the spouse after that, until he finally finds one who genuinely loves him. And that way, Jay can always receive payments from the slat as long as he's married. He'll be marrying somebody for his own money. That will be interesting. Well, I'm sorry, I have to be married or I can't get money out of this slat unless I'm destitute. How do you become destitute? Well, you do an in incomplete gift trust in Nevada and give that your assets. What's the control trust? This has nothing to do with Maxwell Smart. Control was the evil agency. No, control was the nice people in Maxwell Smart. So the control trust has to do with the Internal Revenue Code provision of the day, 2036A2, which says if you give something away and you retain the right, individually or in conjunction with others to control when it will be enjoyed, then it's in your estate for estate tax purposes. We don't think 2036A2 should apply to this arrangement because Jay's power over the Wyoming LLC is based upon a fiduciary standard, but courts have disagreed in the Powell decision and the Strangy decision. So if Jay wants to be super safe, he can set up a separate trust, have a trustee other than he and his spouse, as the trustee of the control trust, give it one tenth of 1% ownership in the Wyoming LLC and the sole right to decide if and when there will be a liquidation of the LLC and the sole right to determine if the LLC operating agreement will ever be amended. And then you have no Powell problem. This needs to be put into place at least from the inception of the LLC or within three years before Jay's death. The IRS has looked at uh, many situations like this and has not brought out the Powell or Strangy decision. It seems that they're only bringing that up when there are abusive situations. I don't consider this to be abusive, but the control trust, which takes extra work, is safer. So what do you have to report on a gift tax return? The seed capital gift, yes. The funding of the family LLC, no. The sale, no. And the cancellation of the gift of the note, yes. People ask me why keep a note in place because then it has to pay me interest. One, one reason would be that the note usually is not worth anywhere near the face amount for estate tax purposes. So if I sell a note to a trust, 2% interest, 15 year interest only, balloon after 15 years. I, that's a $1 million note. What would you pay me for that note? Even if that note was owed by an insurance company or the US government, no one would pay me a million dollars for that note. It would be discounted, maybe by 20 to 25%. So then I die with a million dollar note, it's taxed at 750,000. That's better than me getting paid back from the trust. So the rate that we can use on an installment note if I go to October 2021, if it's a three year or lower term note, 8.18%. So, Grandpa, if your Vanguard municipal bond account is earning 1%, and you can give that, you can sell that account to your grandchild's trust for 8.18%, then the difference, the delta, of eight, 82 hundredths of a percent is going to that grandchild trust without any tax cost. And then you can bring it back when you need it just by having them prepay the note. A note of up to nine years, 0.91%. A note of longer than nine years, 1.74%. And these are normally interest only, and they balloon at the life expectancy of the 
person who receives the note. Now, uh, and by the way, when you do a sale, you can do the lowest of the last of this month and the last two months before that. So you could actually do a sale at 1.73%. And by the way, it has to be compounded semi-annually and you use the compounded semi-annually rate, not the compounded annual rate, because that's what Professor Hesch says the statute says. That's 7872F2. Okay. Page 74. You have the client, age 73. You have the trust. The client can do a three year note, a nine year note, or a self canceling installment note. For a 73-year-old, you go to Tiger Tables or Number Cruncher, you find out, you plug in the, the uh, applicable federal rate and the age, and they tell you that it's a 12-year balloon, that's the life expectancy of a 73-year-old, 6.2% interest, and if the, client, if the client dies before the 12th year, the note is completely out of the client's estate for estate tax purposes. And we like to show clients that you could, all, you could have the numbers for the, for one spouse, you can have the numbers for the other spouse, and you can have joint numbers. So for you planners, if I can open this up. By the way, the touch, the touch, uh, the touch monitor that allows my hands to move things like that without having to hit a zoom button has been very much worth the $200 investment. So now if I do a joint note, I could do a joint 21 year old, I mean 21 year skin, and if they both die before the term is over, then the note is out of the estate for estate tax purposes. So if you have an unhealthy couple, or if you have a client that says, hey, I don't, I can't live off of 1.9% of, of this note. I don't, I only have so much left in my estate. I'll go for the 3.2%, and then if I die, the kids get a windfall, or I'll go for a 17-year note at 4.2%. And my spouse can go for a 17-year note at 4.2%. So that's how we calculate these things. Now, time is short, both for this webinar and for uh, people trying to do the planning. So here you have one spouse owning some assets. They have joint assets. The, spout, the, the other spouse has assets. And they say, what do, you, what do you recommend we freeze? And the answer is everything. Well, how do we shift the assets? Well, you're not gonna shift the assets. You're gonna form an LLC and you're gonna put all this stuff in there. And then we're gonna do a math calculation and figure out that the husband got 39.9%, the wife got 60.1% of the value. The husband sells his ownership interest to a uh, slat, after making a seed capital gift, the wife sells her to a slat after making a seed capital gift, and then they live uh, quite happily ever after. So we have a lot of, of these examples in our materials here. Uh, you can go to, I believe, our website if you want to learn about the Biden two-step. The article is still pretty informative, uh, even though it was written in August of uh, 2020. I think it's still on uh, still on point. Uh, I thank Jerry Hesch and Marty Shinkman for doing a lot of the lifting on this article and how we describe the uh, the technique or the techniques that we are using. Um, I wanted to mention the GRAT and talk just a little bit more about the new law change situation from this week. At the very beginning of this week, I, as I told you, this explanation came out from the Ways and Means Committee, which says that if a grant or trust that owes me money swaps assets with me after the date of enactment, in other words, I've set it up, I've funded it, I got a note, but now I decide I want to sell something else to the trust after the law is signed then I'll have to pay capital gains tax if that asset is an appreciated asset. If the asset's gone down in value, I'm not allowed to take the loss the way that they want this law to read. So 
if this law is looking like it has legs, now to the extent we can, we can reach out to clients and say, hey, consider what you have in your trust, consider what you have outside of your trust. And if you wanna trade those assets or sell more to the trust, get moving quickly. Because otherwise, once the bill is signed, if it is signed the way the Ways and Means Committee wants it, you won't be able to do transactions with a grant or trust anymore, unless it's property that's equal in value to what you're receiving back or is less in value, in which case you may uh, lose a capital loss. The alternative to the installment sale that we commonly use is the grant or retained annuity trust. And here's one where a $350 million business could be put 10% into a grant or retained annuity trust. 10% of 350 million is 35 million. Take a discount, make that 25 million. And then a GRAT, you put that in a GRAT, the GRAT would pay you 8,330,000 a year for three years and whatever's left in the GRAT is out of your estate. But it would take some pretty good cash flow. This company would have to be have $83 million a year of positive cash flow for this, or uh, I'm sorry, would have to have, yep, $83 million a year of positive cash flow, which is probably not gonna work. Now, if you did a, a, fi a, a five-year GRAT, then the payments would be $5 million a year, and the company would be 50 million, need 50 million of cash flow, and that might work for this particular client. And then whatever is in the GRAT after the fifth year is out of the estate for estate tax purposes. Now, unfortunately, the way Congress wants this law to, I mean, the way the House Ways and Means Committee explanation reads, if the GRAT gives cash to the client and the GRAT is formed and funded before the new law, then everything's fine. But if the GRAT has to give stock to the client because the company has a bad year, doesn't have a lot of cash, and nobody will loan to the GRAT, then the GRAT gives stock and that will trigger income tax if that happens. So even if you have a GRAT now that's old and cold and it's not all paid out, you wanna make sure that GRAT has plenty of cash or bonds or other assets with high basis if it's not if it does, if it's been paying out appreciated stock to satisfy the um, GRAT payments. So uh, I did not cover nearly as much as I intended to cover, but what I can do now is uh, give you some bonus time and answer some of the questions that, that came in. Um, for those of you who need to leave early, I don't want you to feel left out. So I promise not to say anything funny or really memorable between now and the time that we end this webinar. I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask. I'm going to answer some questions, and then I'm going to show uh, a couple of estate view um, illustrations. So uh, let's see what the intelligent clock things. Okay, what were the three states that don't disclose LLC ownership? Well, many states don't disclose ownership, but a lot of them require you to disclose the manager. And then that ends up on their website. The three we like to use are Wyoming, Colorado, and Delaware. Wyoming and Delaware also offer tenancy by the entirety's protection. So if it's jointly owned and one spouse is sued, the other spouse says creditor, I mean, the others, you can't take the tenancy by the entirety's assets pursuant to the law of Wyoming or Delaware. So we like those states over Colorado for people who, and Colorado doesn't have charging order protection. So probably more than you wanted to know there. Um, how does the transfer of a house to a Cupert affect the step up in basis on death? Well, if you die during the term, you still get your step up. If you die after the term, and the trust is disregarded for income tax purposes, in my lowly opinion, you get the step up. We think there's sufficient support for the proposition that you can report it that way on your federal income tax return without saying that there's no substantial uh, position. We think you have substantial support for that. 
to, as it is today. But you may lose that step up on the house, on the death after the uh, period runs if they change that law. And they are likely to change that law. So you are trading the step up and a 20 to 25% capital gains rate for getting the house out of your estate and saving 40% of estate tax. You have to be the judge of, of what works best. Okay, will interest on promissory notes be taxable under the new law? The answer is no, as long as that trust is a defective grant or trust formed and fully funded before the deadline and you um, have a note in place, definitely that note will be grandfathered under the present proposal. And I believe that even if you sell assets at a gain, to the trust after the uh, deadline, that interest may not be taxable, but I'm not absolutely sure on that. And I don't know that anyone does. Um, let me see. The SLAT and the grantor or the grantor's trust would own the LLC and each is considered a separate partner, even if the SLAT income tax is paid by the grantor. Well, you can consider them partners in the conventional sense, but you could also disregard these entities for income tax purposes. If I set up an LLC in its own 10% by my revocable trust, 50% uh, by a disregarded trust in Nevada that's a complete gift trust, and 45% by another trust in Nevada that's an incomplete gift trust, you still don't have a uh, an entity that has to be recognized for income tax purposes, all the income and deductions are going to go on my return. Now, if all those entities are actually done by a married couple and they are joint owners, joint grantors, then if they live in a community property state, you can still disregard the LLC and all the trusts. If they live in a non-community property state, I believe, and many people believe, including the author of the disregarded entity BNA portfolio, that they can be disregarded. Although the instructions to the IRS Form 1065 say that they should file a Form 1065, the IRS instructions are not binding on the IRS or taxpayers. So you, you can look at that and possibly dis, disregard it. Okay. The dis, somebody thought that the school closure rules say you have to report a sale as an additional disclosure on, on the Form 709. I don't believe that's the case, and I've never been told by anybody that that's the case, and I've never seen that in the instructions of the gift tax return. And yes, the note that you sell the assets to can be a skin. Okay, what's the best way to create a trust for a child you're contributing cash to? I do like the Section 678 trust. Um, there's a song about it on YouTube. If you search Gasman 678 Trust, or at least an explanation that I gave to my granddaughter at a conference that a lot of people thought was cute. They think my granddaughter's cute. They don't think I'm cute at all. Okay, what's the best way to create a trust for the child you're contributing cash to? I'm sorry. So you put the assets in the Section 678 Trust, or better yet, part ownership of an S corporation, or a partnership, so then the income goes to that 678 trust, it's taxed at the child's bracket, and then you can get the trustee of the trust can give the child what they need to pay the taxes and maybe no more than that. Or if the child misbehaves, you spend it on the other children and the child still has to pay the income tax. They're stuck. They can't get out of it, which I think is interesting. I've never heard of litigation about that, but it could happen. Okay, any preference on the difference between a slat and a beat it? Thank you, Amrish, for that question. Uh, a slat, I can safely put significant assets into and do an installment sale, and it's disregarded for tax purposes, but because I'm the one who set it up, I can't control where it goes when I die. I can't rewrite the slat. I can't change my mind about where the slack goes while I'm alive. On the other hand, if my parents form a trust for me and make me the trustee, 
And I, I can have the power to take out what I need for health education and maintenance. And to, in addition to that, direct where the trust goes on my death, as long as I don't direct it to a creditor, a creditor of my estate, me personally, or my estate. I could direct it to my best friend, my favorite charity, my next spouse, even someone I don't like. With the beat it, the parent or some friend forms the trust as a gift, but my power to withdraw over the trust is limited to the greater of, is limited to $5,000. And therefore, under the income tax law, I'm considered to be the owner of the trust. It's a section 678 trust. And even though I had a withdrawal right that I didn't exercise, because it was $5,000 or less, I'm not considered to be a contributor to the trust for estate and gift tax purposes. So the trust is treated as owned by me. I can sell assets to it in exchange for a note, not pay income tax, and I can receive benefits and I can direct where it goes. So I put down this $5,000 seed capital gift. I mean, I received this trust with a $5,000 value. Now I sell the trust a million dollar asset in exchange for a million dollar note. And when that million dollar asset has gone up to 2 million in value and the note is still only a million, I repay the note to myself. Now there's a million in the trust. It's estate tax free, it's creditor proof because I wasn't the contributor to the trust under state law if it's put in a, if it's done in a state that allows for that. And to make it even uh, better, I can direct where the trust goes when I die. I'm not doing beat it's because to me, it's a little bit far-fetched to say that I would do an arm's length sale for a million dollars to a trust that only has a $5,000 net worth. So then what do you do? You pay someone a guarantee fee to try to make it an arm's length sale. But if the IRS comes in and says, you know, yeah, your dad only put 5,000 in the trust, but you've really put made a $40,000 gift when you uh, did this sale. So we're gonna say that you contributed 45,000 out of a $50,000 trust and that it's 90% in your estate. And that's the reason that I've done very, very few beat it. Now there's a lot of people who say you can't beat it. Um, Dick Oceans, O-S-H-I-N-S, -S, has a lot of great things on the Ocean and Oceans website. Uh, Steve Oceans is his son, very well respected. I have a lot of respect for them. Um, and I think it, the beat it is something that they've you know, really contributed to the tax community along with other people. Um, but just not, not for me. Okay, is a conventional IRA going to children subject to estate tax or just ordinary income? No, it's both. It's both, and that's why clients with big IRAs have a big issue. If you know you're gonna die in a few weeks, you withdraw the IRA, pay the income tax, because that reduces the estate tax. But if you don't know you're gonna die, and that's what happens to most people, you end up leaving the IRA to your children, has to come out within 11 years of your death, and they're paying full 40% estate tax out of other assets and then paying income tax when they get it out of the IRA. So if you have a $10 million estate and all you have is IRA assets, what you might wanna do is buy some assets from your spouse for a promissory note and put those assets into a slat for the spouse. That's aggressive, but it may work. So let's say I have a $10 million in an IRA and no other assets. My wife has $10 million of stock. I buy $7 million worth of stock from her for a $7 million note. Then I put the $7 million worth of stock in the slat. I use discounts, installment sales, pixie dust, and everything else. When I die, I've used very little of my exemption and my estate consists of that IRA minus the promissory note plus the promissory note I'm owed. And we do have a slide on that in the, in the materials. We talked about it last week. If you're interested in it, let me know and I can point out where the um, slide was or where, you know, where those slides were. Okay, here's another great question. 
is a broker opinion of value acceptable or do you need a certified appraisal for gifting? Well, I'm gonna say that a state certified appraisal of real estate is highly recommended, but that a broker opinion of value may be sufficient, especially if it has two or three good comparables attached to it that would be used by a licensed appraiser. If you're putting that in an LLC and you're gifting a part ownership of the LLC, then the fact that you don't have an MAI appraisal or a licensed appraiser appraisal may not be as harmful because when the IRS reads the report, they see the valuation for the discount, they see the recitation of the value of the real estate, they see the broker of a, the broker opinion makes sense, they look at the tax assessor value, they look at Zillow, and they may not call you to the carpet on why you did not get a commercial appraisal. Now, a lot of my colleagues think you have to get a commercial appraisal. Lightning may strike me. If it strikes me during this talk, hopefully it won't hurt your computer. It'll only hurt mine. But uh, a broker opinion of value may work. And, and for those of you who are lawyers and CPAs out there, everyone else cover your ears. I had a client who wanted to do all this stuff and refused to get the appraisal. So when it came time to uh, file the gift tax return, he had his CPA file it without an appraisal of the discount. So sure enough, he got audited and the auditor called me and said, where'd you get your discount? And I said, well, he took a 34% discount because the same month, another client got a report on a substantially similar situation. And, you, and this client decided to use the same discount. So the auditor said, well, send me a sterilized copy of the other appraisal for the other client that was similar. Let me look at it. So we sterilized the appraisal. We sent it to the IRS auditor. The IRS auditor called back and said, you know, this looks pretty good. Would your client settle for 31%? And I said, sure he would. He's a reasonable person, wants to help the government all he can. So now the clients on the call on this webinar, you can uncover your ears. And when clients, you know, come in and say, I'll do this and that, but I'm not going to do the other thing. Well, that, you know, many lawyers will not accept that and say, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be your lawyer if you're not going to do all that stuff. But others of us are practical and say, well, it's probably going to help your family as long as you understand the risks and you're the one taking them or your children are the ones taking them. That's fine. All right. So that completes the uh, questions and answers. I thank you for them. I, I wanted to go ahead and, and show a couple of things on the um, state view because I've had some questions this week and I know some of you who asked the questions are still on. So here I've set this up, uh, Bob and Mary sample, a million five residents, investments 10 million, 392. Um, Bob's going to die in 15 years. The house is going to grow at 3% a year. He's, he is actually going to earn 500,000 a year more than they spend for the next 14 years. His assets are going to grow at about 7% after fees and taxes. And with uh, no planning as they stand today, there would be a $516,000 estate tax. But no planning with the time value of money and no credit shelter trust. On Bob's death in 14 years, the residence is worth 2 million three, the investments are worth 71 million. On Mary's death in 24 years, a mere 54 million in federal estate tax. Well, we can knock some of that out by doing the credit shelter trust. So I click on bypass trust, has nothing to do with heart health. Uh, but now on his death, the Credit Shelter Trust gets a 7 million six funding. That's the most that you can put in there. Um, and I know that because I went to there and that's what it told me. Um, so now the estate tax is down to 50 million. That's nice. And if the annual exclusion does not drop to 50% and it stays at 11 million seven, I can unclick this box and see that the estate tax would be 44 million. So I'm gonna recommend that these people do a little bit more planning. Now they could do annual gifting, 
and we set up uh, annual gifting of uh, $60,000 a year while they're both alive, growing with inflation. And then after his death with inflation, she'll start making gifts of 40,000 a year. That's for two children. So then the gifting trust will have 4 million two that will be out of their estates for estate tax purposes. So then if they do discounted gifting, they could save more, but we don't think this discounted gifting is gonna be around. So I'm not gonna spend that much time on it. But if we uh, go to the gifting and we uh, say that they'll be taking a 35% discount, but they'll have a couple more grandchildren, then the gifting is a little bit better as you see there, but the estate tax is still 37 million. Um, I'm gonna skip life insurance because that's a whole different ball game. And then I'm gonna go to the installment sale. Now, when I clicked installment sale, it went the estate tax went down to 19 million. Whereas before the installment sale, the estate tax was 37 million. So what did I do to reduce that? Let's go to the installment sale module. I show here the slide that I was showing you for Jay. Remember, Jay had $11 million worth of stock that he was going to put in to a, a slat. And I said, instead of putting the $11 million in, how about if you sell, how about if you put the $11 million in an LLC and sell the 99% non-voting member interest for a $7,800,000 note? make a, let's say here, make a $750,000 seed capital gift. And this reduces your estate tax to $18 million. So, you know, that that is pretty sweet. I've got the interest rate at 1.75. It really should be more like two. And I've got the, the, the note ballooning in 23 years. So that's one of Jay's choices. That's the installment sale. Now, the other choice that Jay had was just gift it, just make it a gift. And we, I can show that by reducing the note to, to uh, zero. Let me see, just reduce the note to zero and re-click. Make sure I've got the note reduced to uh, zero. Come on down. There we go. So the note reduces to zero and the estate tax will be higher. So higher estate, oh, lower. So if you don't take the note back, then the estate tax goes down to 11 million. So you just get making it as a discounted gift. Cause some of you emailed me and said, I wanna make a large discounted gift this year. How do you show that on a state view? Well, you have to jury rig it cause we're not that far yet. So show your seed capital gift is zero and then show a sale for a zero note. And then that will allow you to show what 11 million discounted to 7 million 750 gives that much more in estate tax savings. Um, so his other choice was have no sale, bring that down to zero, and move the seed capital gift up to 11, I mean, move the gift up to the 11 million. And then you see there is a lot of estate tax savings. I'll, get, I'll keep cranking this to 11, but not quite as much. So those are the three choices as shown on uh, this chart. Now, if you go to the timetable, now we're seeing his death uh, in 2020, 2035 and uh, a lot of estate tax. So I can, he may ask me, you know, how much would I have to sell in addition to the 11 million to get my estate tax down to zero. So I just keep clicking here until the red goes away. When the red goes away, I have no estate tax. So if he would do, get this, he makes an $11 million gift of that closely held stock. And then he puts another 11 million of assets, that's coincidental, into an LLC and sells that for an $11 million note. Now the forecast is there wouldn't be any estate tax until 2021. And then if he says, well, what if I die earlier? Okay, I'll just move your death up here. And it still works. What if I die later after her? I can move the death there. She dies first. It still works pretty well. 
But the safest thing is if he's got uh, more that he can freeze because he's got 21 million in assets, why wouldn't he even do more in case the in case the thing assets grow at a higher rate? For example, if the assets grow at a much higher rate, how high would they have to go before you'd have a problem? I guess not that not I guess you're not going to have a problem at that amount. So uh, then I can go back to the trust logistics. And then if I want to record, and unfortunately, the software does not allow you to store this anywhere. You have to re-enter everything. I apologize for that. We sell enough units, we'll put that in. But just to remember what we were doing at this stage, I can click the client letter. So now it generates a Word uh, document. There it is, which explains all the assumptions. If you want a copy of that, Kelsey will be glad to um, send it to you. And let me see if I have my other module here. So here is, for those of you still awake, oops, wrong one. Here's the second module in estate view. And uh, this is a single individual with a $30 million net worth, uh, saves 200,000 a year above what she spends. The assets are growing at 7%, pays 1% of the value of the assets in uh, income taxes, has used, uh, let's say, a million, a million two of her lifetime exclusion. She makes a seed capital gift of 600,000. Then she, uh, let's, let's move that up to a million. And then uh, puts 15 million, 285 into an LLC, takes a 30% discount, has a sale price of 10 million in exchange for a note. The note bears interest at 2%. State tax rate is 40%. Consumer price index will grow at 2.96%. We will make the note a conventional note since it's a 2% interest. And the note term will be for 20 years. And she will it will remain as a grantor trust for the entire time. And uh, we're going to project up to 25 years. So now you have your spreadsheet. Unfortunately, the spreadsheet is not exportable, but the next time you see this, I hope it will be. That's one of the things on our list, our, our wish list for the, for the um, uh, programmer. So he starts off with a $30 million estate, but immediately after the sale, he has a $24 million estate because of the discount taken on the note. So when he dies, even next year, the estate tax savings is almost $2 million because of the discount that was taken on the note. But what else is happening here? So in, in the next year after the sale, you're going to have uh, his assets um, uh, in his estate are going to be $13 million growing after taxes at 810,000, annual spending saving 200,000, the payment from the note he receives, he's going, I'm, yeah, the payment, so let, let's go over this again, I'm sorry. He's got 24 million of total assets. That consists of 13 million outside of the note, and that's gonna be growing at 7%, 810,000. Then he's got, the annual savings of 200,000. He gets the note payment, 214,000. He pays the income tax on the note. <clears throat> now, when you add the note into that, his estate is worth 25 million. His exclusion is down to 9 million five. His estate tax liability, 6 million. Now, uh, what happens on the trust side? The trust starts with a seed capital gift, but it actually has equity of uh, it has assets of 16 million because of what he put in. It owes him a 10 million note. There's no, uh, there's growth here in this year of a million 154. That's 7% growth. Um, it makes an interest payment to him. It has net assets then of 6 million seven. And then uh, at the bottom here in 2041, the trust is now worth 51 million. The note is still 10 million seven. Uh, it's growing at 3 million six that year at a 7% rate of return. 
So that trust ends up being worth $44 million. So that's a $1 million to promissory uh, capital investment into the LLC, a $15 million worth of assets committed to an installment sale, reasonable progress, and the client ends up with outside of the, his estate $44 million, a $17 million savings. Now, if we go with a self-canceling note, I click self-canceling, the numbers should change, and we increase the interest rate, let's say that he needs to go with 5%. Now, the savings are tremendous if he lives, for some reason it's not showing me, I guess I have to reset it, but the savings would be tremendous if he lives, I mean, if he's fortunate enough to die, but less if he lives to the full term. So that's the second module of the estate view. Uh, if anyone's in, if you're a client, you uh, get this for free, just let us know, we'll send it to you. And there's, there are instructional videos. If you're a colleague, it's $79, <coughs> making it less expensive than a large boat for me. But fortunately, I don't have a boat. So this is my um, expensive hobby. So thank you very much for joining us today. If I did not answer your questions, please feel free to email them to agasman at gasmanpa.com. I'll keep giving these talks as long as people show up. I'm surprised at how many of you are enjoying it, to be quite honest. If there's anything I can do to make it more enjoyable, such as by uh, bringing a silly puppet with me, I'll be glad to do so. Otherwise, have a fantastic rest of your day. And I hope that you can help use this information to help yourself and help others. Thank you.